So today we are starting a new series uh, called Hidden in Plain View. And the, the idea of this series, and the reason I'm so excited about it is because a lot of times we look around and we say, I want to see God. I want to know God. I love God. I look around me though and I sometimes feel like I don't see him. I know he's there though. I just don't know where to look. I don't know how to see him. And, and the reality is he is truly, he's hidden in plain view. Sometimes he's right there, right in front of us. And we just don't see him. One of my favorite childhood games and one of my favorite games that I we love playing with the kids is hide and seek. All right? Hide and seek. And this was me when I was a little kid. I always loved hiding behind my mom's big long curtains that came all the way down to the floor. We don't have those anymore. Most houses just have mini blinds these days, right? But I was that little kid. I was hiding by the window and whose shadow was casting right through, okay? For some people, they would walk right by. But most people, they would look and they would say, oh, there's something back behind there. It's either an animal or a young child or, or maybe both. But he's right there and hidden right there in plain view for us to see. Today's talk, we're going to be speaking about, in part one, Jesus in the scriptures. And how is it that we find Christ right in front of our eyes as we look at the scriptures? In just a couple of weeks, the Coptic Church is going to be celebrating a three-day celebration called the Feast of the Cross. And at the Feast of the Cross, we find the story of uh, Queen Helen, who comes and she finds the cross, and she was on a search, she was on a hunt to find the cross of Jesus. And so she comes in Jerusalem and, and says, like, we have to find the cross. And, and she said, where is it? And they said, it's over there and it's covered up by dirt. Like they basically, uh, back in the day, someone, like so a group of people, they didn't want it known, they didn't want it seen, they felt there was power, there was something special in it, and they decided to bury it in trash and dirt and stuff like that. And so she began to uncover and send in her people to just clear it, and it was right there in front of everyone, but it just needed to be uncovered. And the beauty is, the story goes that when it was uncovered, the way that they realized and learned whose, which cross was the cross of Jesus is that they laid someone who was sick onto death onto the, the different crosses. And when they laid them on the, the third cross, that the person was healed and rose. And so the, 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 the reason I say that story is because oftentimes Christ in the scriptures is right there in front of us but we just don't see him. But when we see him, there's a power unto life in him in, revealed in the scripture. And that's really what we're looking for today is how do we get rid of that, that stuff in front of our eyes so that we can uncover the truth of who Christ is right in front of us. And that's what we're going to be doing not only today, but over the next three weeks as well. If you have one of the, the bulletins, you'll find some, uh, some fill in the blanks, some space, and a verse right at the top of the, uh, of, of the bulletin. Right at the top, we're going to be looking through, and this is going to be the main verse that we'll be looking at today. If you don't have one, they're on the, the back chair uh, when you first walk in. But we're going to be looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13 to 16. And this image... For us that we find in 2 Corinthians 3, I think is a very important one that lends to today's topic very well. Verse 13 picks up, Moses put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. But their minds were blinded for until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lays on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. The passage is simply saying is that when the Old Testament was open and read, that there was a veil, there was something that was blinding the people from understanding what was proper to be understood from it, from the reading of it. 
from the reading of the Old Testament. And what St. Paul clearly says is that the veil is lifted when we turn to Christ. The veil is only lifted in Christ. He's the one who removes this veil, this, this thing that separates us from him to see him properly. St. Jerome, who is a 4th century Latin father, he says the following. He talks about the curtain of the veil. Okay, And he says the curtain of the temple, rather, he says the curtain of the temple is torn. The curtain of the temple is torn. And this happens when Christ is crucified. We know that there were many miracles and signs that followed when Jesus Christ was crucified. And one of them was that the curtain was rent in half. So St. Jerome says the curtain of the temple is torn and the mysteries of the law are revealed. To the faithful, but the unbelievers, to the unbelievers, they are hidden to this very day. Okay? So, in a literal sense, when the curtain was torn, the mysteries were exposed, right? They could, everyone could see what was inside. And what we're being told here is, by both St. Paul and St. Jerome, is that in Christ, that curtain that separates us, from seeing the Holy of Holies himself, Jesus Christ, is opened up for us. Our eyes are open to see him more clearly. Imagine you're standing out here, and what's going through everyone's head when they're standing out here? Everyone. What is happening on the other side of the curtain? Right? I mean, everyone, everyone wants to know what's happening on the other side. Everyone wants to know. What does it look like on the other side? I wish I could be over there and see it for myself. Well, that's the beauty of what Christ has done for us, is that he has torn that curtain wide open so that we can see clearly who he is and we can see the mysteries of the law that are revealed to the faithful. St. Paul tells us that this veil is taken away. If you look in your verses in the, in, in the bulletin, at verse 14 to 16, it says, the veil is taken away in Christ. The veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Okay? The veil is taken away only in Christ. If I'm not in Christ, if I myself, even as a Christian, I'm not living in Christ, I may read the scriptures and just not get it. I may not see it. Because I the only way I can see properly is if he himself gives me light so that my eyes can be open and that veil is lifted off and I can see as, it should, as the world should be seen. St. Augustine of Hippo says it a, a little bit differently. Let me read to you from Augustine. He says, It is not the Old Testament that is done away within Christ. He says the issue is not when Christ comes, delete the Old Testament, do away with it. No, he's saying what's done away is the concealing veil. What gets stripped away is this veil that prevents us from seeing God as he is. He goes on. So that it may be understood through Christ, when any of them turn from the Old Testament to Christ, the veil shall be taken away. What Augustine here is saying is that when we are in Christ, the veil is lifted, and we see through Christ. We see more properly. We see more clearly. The reality is, and, and Rafit hit this during the discussion, is that the New Testament gives us a fuller understanding of who God is, so that when we read the Old Testament, we understand God as He always has been. By the, and it's by the grace and faith in Christ that the veil is truly re removed, so that we can see Christ clearly in the Old Testament, okay? Let me give you three reasons, and again, these are on your bulletin. Uh, you can fill in if you'd like, but the three reasons why the veil oftentimes remains. Oftentimes we look at the scripture, we look around us, and we don't see Christ. We feel like there's something that is blinding us or preventing us from seeing Him more clearly. If you look at the passage, if 
you look at the passage in verse 14, it says, But their minds were blinded. Until this day, the same veil remains lifted in the reading of the Old Testament. In the reading. The veil remains in the reading, not the writing. In other words, the, it's not, the issue is not the writing. The issue is the reading. St. Hilary of Poitiers says it very nicely. He says, Scripture is not in the reading. It's in the understanding. The issue is not in the text. The issue is that our minds have to be illuminated so that this veil is stripped off so that we can see Christ crucified, saving us in His glory. By the way, during liturgy, we do something that I think lends to this, and it's a really powerful image. After the creed, after the sermon, after the creed, the priest stands and he prays a part of the liturgy called the prayer of reconciliation, right? During the prayer of reconciliation, it's a reminder that we have been reconciled to God, and as a result, we too should be reconciled to one another, and the two are not mutually exclusive. But at a certain point, the priest takes a veil and does what with it? Puts it in front of his eyes. When the veil is in front of his eyes, what's he unable to see on the other side? The deacon who's standing there holding the cross, right? The deacon who's standing there proclaiming salvation through Jesus Christ, holding the cross up, and then he begins to say, greet one another with a holy kiss. In other words, he's telling us our reconciliation, our ability to greet one another in holiness and love comes through Christ, crucified and glorified. But sin blinds us from seeing it. Sin is what blinds us from seeing it. Our own spiritual state is oftentimes what prevents us from seeing God clearly revealed. Three reasons I'm going to give you why we oftentimes are unable, if you will, to see as we look for Christ even in the scriptures. Number one is hardened hearts lead to blind eyes. Hardened hearts, when our hearts get hard, we oftentimes can't see clearly. Hardened hearts happen when someone does something to us and we just get angry and we're like, I'm never going to forgive. I'm never going to do. I'm never. I'm never going to give them another chance. Something, tragedy happens and we say, I'm never going to, never going to understand how God could do this. Never. And our hearts get hard to sin into the world around us, to the people around us. Origen says it beautifully. He says, entreat, ask Beg the Holy Spirit to remove any cloud, any cloud which obscures the vision of our hearts that are hardened with the same stains of sin, in order that we may be able to hold the spiritual and wonderful knowledge of His law. Sometimes, friends, sin causes us to have our hearts hardened. When we keep falling into sin and giving into sin, our hearts get hardened. And our eyes, as a result, become clouded. We're unable to see. When I'm living, and people say, well, yeah, but God loves us and accepts us as we are. Absolutely. But He never leaves us in that state. And oftentimes, that little saying is a justification that many of us use in order to stay in sin. But the negative impact it has on us is not just an eternal one. It's one that we begin to experience now, like this feeling of frustration. Like, I want to see God. One of the things that we have to begin by doing, and the fathers speak about this, this journey that we go through in our own life of salvation on earth. And it starts with tears of repentance and purification. And then goes to the next step, which is theoria, the ability to see God and to see Him around us and to see Him in ways that sometimes our eyes are clouded to see. The second reason is carnal minds, carnal minds, carnality leads us not to look up, but to look down. When we're living carnally, when all we're worried about is earthly, temporal, material things, we're unable to see the spiritual gifts that are right in front of us. St. John Chrysostom says beautifully, he says, the veil is not there because of Moses, but because of the carnality of our minds. The carnality of our minds. The problem oftentimes is not in the law, but in the reading of Scripture as a legalist. And what I mean by reading it as a legalist is that we oftentimes read it 
because we want to know exactly what we need to do, what's the baseline we need to do, just so we can squeak into heaven. Just so we make sure we're not upsetting God. We just don't want to take him off, okay? But we're just like, give me the basics of what I have to do. That's carnality, my friends. That's me saying, give me the lowest common denominator so I can just do what is like the most basic. When we live that way, that oftentimes present, prevents us from seeing. Because we're not looking to spiritual things when we do that. I believe it's Colossians chapter 3. St. Paul says, set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. Now when we seek heavenly things, we see the one, the heavenly groom, our, our own heavenly groom right in front of us, even when we open up the Old Testament, which many of us have admittedly said that it's difficult to read sometimes and to see and to find Christ there. Third and final. Third reason is spiritual negligence oftentimes leads to lost understanding. Our own spiritual negligence leads us to the inability to see. Okay? <coughs> Loses us to, to, to not be able to see clearly or to lose understanding. Let me read you another quote from John Chrysostom here. He says, let us beware lest not only when Moses is read, and this is, this is like, this is the, the, the danger that oftentimes we fall into, but listen to what he says. Beware lest not only when Moses is read, but also when Paul is read, a veil be placed over our heart. And clearly if we hear negligently, if we, if we bring no zeal of learning to learning and understanding, not only are the scriptures of the law and prophets, but also the apostles and gospels covered for us with a great veil. He says, don't, if we are spiritually negligent, oftentimes when we read not just the Old Testament, but the New Testament, we just don't get it. He's saying, be zealous in your relationship with Christ. Be zealous in your reading of Scripture, searching for the Word. Be zealous when you read the Scriptures that you're receiving the Word of life Himself as spoken to you personally. Be zealous in your desire to learn and to understand. Let me give you two... So, so those are three spiritual reasons. Okay? Let me give you an exegetical reason or a exegesis is just a, it's a big fancy churchy word that means like how we explain things, how we understand things, how we, um, when you read something, people often say, say what does this verse mean? Okay? What does this concept mean? That's exegesis, okay? Being able to give an explanation of a specific passage. We preachers like big fancy churchy words though, okay? So I'm going to say exegetical reasons, all right? Everyone say exegesis. All right. Oh, you guys did it. All right, good. All right, so exegesis. All right, so the, the, the question when, when we read the scriptures, the Old Testament in particular, all right, and this, this is not a new issue, but this is an old issue that's been revisited. The question when we read the scriptures, are we reading the Old Testament as a history or as preaching? Okay? For some people, they just want to read it as a historical book. And others, they say it's preaching. Let's look at the history behind this debate, okay? Because this, this is important for us and within our own context as, as uh, an Alexandrian school of thinking, as a, the Coptic church, this has some interesting things for us in our own history, okay? So what we find, what we find is the first way that the scripture oftentimes is approached is with a historical emphasis of the text, a historical emphasis of the text. What I want to tell you is this approach is, com is incomplete. It doesn't work. Okay? A historical emphasis of the text is incomplete. This school develops in a place called Antioch in the 4th century. Okay? I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm simply saying it's incomplete. Okay? The Alexandrians took a different approach. But I'll get to that in a few minutes. And I'm, I just want to explain why this can be problematic. The danger with only reading a text as a historical text itself 
is oftentimes we come up, especially, let's focus just on the Old Testament for now, okay? When, you, when we read it just as a historical document, what we're saying is this book, this series of books, is simply a collection of the history of a specific group of people. The problem with that is we reduce it to a history lesson. And it's about learning and memorizing which kings came when and what order were they in, what was the genealogy, and when you slaughter the animal, what part of the fat do you take out, and how do you cook it, and do you burn it, or do you add incense to it, and it becomes literally, that, that, that is the whole thing. It's figuring out historically exactly how things fit and how they worked. And it then even reduces it more so to a specific message about a small group of people called Israel the children of Abraham and Isaac, okay? Israel, Jacob, okay? And his descendants. It becomes reduced to that. It becomes about simply, when we read it in this way, it becomes about just collecting neat facts. And, and listen, I'm a fact junkie, okay? I care more, but the, the problem is like sometimes we love just finding cool little neat facts about things, okay? How many thousands of people were passing through this part and which exact part and what was the journey and how did they pass from here to here and how far was it, how many miles did Jesus walk on this part of his journey and when St. Paul went around his second missionary journey, how many kilometers did he pass from here to here and I mean, we love these facts. How high was this mountain when he went? And what was the weather like? And how, what was the temperature? Like, we, we love those kinds of things. At least I love reading those kinds of things. I think that kind of stuff is neat. The problem is, the problem is sometimes we're more concerned with those little anecdotal facts than we are seeking the truth. And the truth is not simply defined by those historical facts as we understand it. Truth is defined in the person of Jesus. So what we're looking for when we read the Old Testament is not, as Christians, is not a historical reading of it, simply as a history book. I'm not saying discount the historical lens of the text. For sure these things happen. For sure it records an account of these encounters. But that's not exactly what we're after. That's not the goal. That's not the goal. What oftentimes happens, and, and this historical emphasis of the text, leads us to two wings of the debate. And this debate that we find ourselves in as a Eastern church, as a Oriental Orthodox church, here in America, where we look at it and we're like, what are these people bickering about? This development, this, this, this idea of focusing on the scripture simply with the historical emphasis leads to two things, okay? Two wings of the argument. On one side, you have a group that reads the scripture with a fundamental literalist reading of the scripture, which means, which means that if it says that it's in there, then it happened exactly in this way. If I can evidence in here that the, and that, that the world is flat, if there's anywhere in scripture that says the world is flat, then it must be flat. Okay? It must be. If it says God created in six days, it is a literal six days. It's about digging up archaeology and artifacts and, and just proving and evidencing literally it happened exactly in this way, and that is the goal of the reading of Scripture by those who fall within that camp. The response to this, by the way, and there are two sides of the same coin, the response is the liberal historical critical studies, which its purpose is to simply say, well, it didn't happen in that way. And we have archaeological evidence that says that it didn't happen that way. So therefore, the whole thing is a sham. It's all wrong. It's all a lie. Okay? And what this side over here comes back and does and says, no, but we found some archaeological evidence that proves this. And they're back and forth arguing, bickering down here about a historical reading of the text. And we're looking at them thinking, y'all have done, lost your mind. <laughs> you people are crazy. 
okay? Because we're not concerned. Like someone asked me one time, they said, what if, what if you could prove that there was, that, that the flood was local and not worldwide? And I would say, who cares? My concern is not local, global, any of that stuff. My concern is when I read that, I find that Jesus Christ is the ark. His church is the ark in which when I enter into him, I have salvation. And it's only in Christ that I have salvation. He's the ark. And the passing of this world is the flood. Okay? So this historical debate back and forth that sometimes we get ourselves sucked into this argument that's not our own, I think reduces the text, unfortunately, to a false paradigm. Okay, this historical paradigm is not the paradigm that the early Christians read this, the text with. The early Christians, you find for me any of the early church fathers from the first five or six centuries who were debating evidence archaeologically and all that stuff about the Old Testament text. You can't find it. And don't tell me it's because the science was not as developed then. Okay? That is a horrible, horrible excuse. I mean, these people lived closer to the time of Christ and closer to the Old Testament than, than we do. Okay? So their understanding and connection with it was far better than we are 2,000 years later. They were not concerned with that. Their paradigm was, they were not married to this historical paradigm. Again, I'm not suggesting these things did or didn't happen. I'm simply suggesting that the paradigm of the church is Christ himself. He is the paradigm. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He is what it is all about. He is the truth of Scripture. He's not judged by history. He's the truth of history. So when we read Scripture, what we're saying is we want to look and find Jesus Christ. Where is He? Which brings us to the second emphasis, which is a typological, or a type, if you will, a typological emphasis on Christ in the text that lifts the veil. Let me just take you through a little bit. These are just icons, orthodox icons, that help us see Christ in the scripture. Start up on the top left. You see there the tree of life. What is the tree of life? It's the cross of Jesus Christ. Christ crucified, offering himself to us eternally. What do we find next? We find Abraham about to kill Isaac. Okay, or about to sacrifice and offer Isaac. Who is this child who was pure and innocent, who was offered as a sacrifice? It was Jesus Christ. Okay? Come next, the burning bush. The burning bush is one of the clearest ones. We have a, an entire hymn around it about the Theotokos being the, the bush, and inside of her was this, the God-man, Jesus Christ. Okay? The burning bush, ultimately we read that, we say Jesus. Jesus is there. He's approaching to us. He's coming close to us. And he doesn't destroy us when he comes close to us. When he unites himself to our humanity, he comes in order to save us and to be close to us and to speak to us. The next is Jonah. And Jesus actually, when he went through, he actually, if you look up, I believe it's in Matthew and in Luke, Christ gives this example about Jonah. Okay, He gives an example and he said just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days, so will it be with the Son of Man. In other words, what he's saying is I'm the true Jonah. I'm the true Jonah. I'm the prophet that has come to the world. I'm the messenger who's come from the world. I am the God-man who has come to you and who will not be buried in a whale for three days, but will be buried in the earth for three days and rise again. King David. King David, he is the shepherd. <laughs> He's the one who sings to our souls. Not King David, but the king, the true king. Okay? He takes the, 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 the seat of King David. Okay? He is the king par excellence. You have 
the three youth in the, the burning bush in the book, of, uh, not in the burning bush, sorry, in the fiery furnace in the book of Dan Daniel, and you have the Son of Man walking amongst them. Who's that Son of Man? It's the pre-incarnate Christ, the eternal Logos who has entered and come and stood with them and who stands with us in the midst of our trials and tribulations. Let me pop down below. We already spoke about uh, Genesis 6, 7, and 8. That's an icon of the ark. And who is, what is the ark? It's the church. And Christ himself is calling us. Noah is an icon. He's a shadow of Christ. Who Christ himself is calling us into the ark, which is the church in order to avoid destruction, to avoid death. To be united with him in his home. Okay? It's not that we can save ourselves. No. It's when we enter. And that's why many Orthodox churches are built um, are built in the form of either a cross or an ark. Next here we have Isaiah. Isaiah, if you haven't read Isaiah, and we'll probably do a study, I think, at the end of the year, uh, last four weeks leading up to Christmas, but the book of Isaiah is often, it's spoken about as the fifth gospel. When you read through the book of Isaiah, there are so many prophecies that are pointing us to Christ. That is, in, math, in Isaiah chapter 6 and Isaiah 9, Isaiah, Isaiah 56, I mean, they are, or 50, yeah, 56. You go through, the virgin will conceive and give birth. You go through, the government will be upon his shoulders. You go through the suffering server. I mean, Isaiah is, con there's so many prophecies in the book of Isaiah that point us to Christ. <laughs> who was the one who led his people out of slavery to freedom? The true Moses which is Jesus. He leads us from slavery of sin and death in order to experience life. And when we enter that, Joshua leads us, if you will, the true Joshua, Yeshua, Jesus, leads us into the promised land in the book of Joshua. But when we go there, there's a spiritual warfare. There is a struggle that is there. Hosea, one of the most scandalous books in the Old Testament, Hosea was a prophet who was asked to marry a harlot. And this is exactly what God has done. God has come as the God-man, Jesus Christ, in order to wed himself to humanity. When you read the story of the Samaritan woman, this woman who was living pretty much a life of harlotry, many of the church fathers have suggested that the Samaritan woman represents all of us. And this is what Jesus has done. Hosea points us to the truth of what Jesus has done for humanity. My friends, when we read the scripture, when we read the Old Testament, search for Jesus. The typological emphasis on Christ in the text is what lifts the veil. It's Jesus who lifts the veil. <laughs> okay? When we read the scripture, my, my dad said this to me once, a few years back. He said, I don't understand when I read the psalm and... This psalm, it really frustrates me every time. I said, what, what's the problem? He said, this psalm is telling me, I'm, I'm praying God destroy my enemies. He's like, I thought I was supposed to love my enemies. And I said, Dad, your, your enemy is death. Your greatest enemy is death. And God has come to conquer and give you victory over that enemy, which is the final enemy that's, but that St. That Paul actually speaks to in 1 Corinthians 15. When we read the scripture, my friends, read it, with a Christological emphasis, a Christological search for Christ in the lens. That's what lifts the veil. It's Christ who is life-giving. It's Jesus who gives us life. Christ is risen from the dead, and he's revealed in glory in both Testaments. The truth is that Christ is the only truth that matters. He's the only truth that matters. I'll trade all of the cute little historical tidbits in order to know the truth of Christ as revealed in the scriptures. He's the only truth that matters. And that's what the church did when they gathered together. When, when, in the early church, when they gathered together and read the scriptures, their scriptures is what we call the Old Testament, right? When they read, they were searching for Jesus. Jesus. They were searching. He, was, he, is, he said, I'm the truth. I'm the truth. They said, we got to find him. we got to search him. We need to know him more. And he's always been there. We just didn't realize that. 
You know who first did this for, for the disciples? Jesus himself. Luke chapter 24, verse 25 to 27. On the road to Emmaus, he's walking along. This is after this one of the, I believe, 11 or 12 resurrection appearances. And Jesus shows up on this road and he finds these two disciples walking and follow with me. Verse 25. Then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. All, hard to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Okay? He's pointing them back to the prophets. Back to the Old Testament as we would call it. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He took them on probably one of the most fantastical journeys throughout the scriptures. Pointing them to himself. Saying, I've always been there. You just didn't see me. The reality is God is hidden in plain view. He's right in front of our eyes. We're oftentimes just not looking. Or we don't know what we're supposed to be looking for. Let me leave you with a final thought here. Final like, how do we approach this? I'm going to give you a principle for how to approach this. Anyone know what this game is? Anyone know this? Come on, huh? Where's Waldo? All right. And one of my favorite, favorite games growing up. Anyone here never seen Where's Waldo, played Where's Waldo? Just raise your hand. All of you know Where's Waldo? Everyone? Huh? You don't know. It. Okay. Everyone else does, right? Have, if I tell you come up here and find Waldo for me, can you do it? <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Part of the problem, part of the problem, part of the, 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 the issue is we have to know first who Waldo is before we can start looking through here and finding him. Okay. The rest of you, you know, you've played the game. You know what he looks like. Okay. This, by the way, I spent 30 minutes. I was hoping to like circle it in front of you guys and put it in your face. I can't find them, okay? After we're finished here, I'll let you all come up and search for it. All right? But, but we first have to know what Waldo looks like in order to find him. If you don't know what he looks like, exactly what he looks like, you could pick out someone else very easily. You don't even know where to start. You're going to say, who's Waldo? What, is he? <laughs> what does he look like? For us, we have to learn first what he looks like in order to be able to find him. And the same truth is what we find when reading the scripture. The scripture. I'm leaving you with the Where's Waldo principle. Okay? The Where's Waldo principle means that when you look, you know that Waldo looks a certain way. He has this goofy hat on. He has a scarf on. He's a skinny guy. He's Full of funny clothes and peppermint cap and he just, he looks a certain funny way, okay? You know what he looks like. If you don't know what he looks like, you'll never find him. If you have a sort of passing idea of what he looks like, you need to get a better idea, especially before you look through an advanced level like this. If you know exactly what he looks like, then you, and you've studied him carefully, then you're ready to look at the picture and start looking for him. And this Where's Waldo principle that we use to read the scripture is basically this. If you know exactly what Jesus Christ looks like, find him in the Old Testament. If you know exactly what he looks like, if you've read the Gospels, if you've read the New Testament, if you've studied him, if you've come to know him, not just in the written text, but know him personally, experientially, as revealed in the New Testament, then go find him in the Old Testament. If you don't know what he looks like, get to know him first. That's the Where's Waldo principle. When you want to read the Old Testament, as we heard earlier, we start by getting to know what he looks like. That way, just as the church fathers, and just as the apostles did, the apostles, they knew Jesus. So it was very easy for them to say, as it was written in Isaiah, as it was written in Hosea, as it was written, they said, we, we know him. And we know for sure all of that points to him. Okay? That's how we approach the scriptures, my friends. Let me leave you with a final quote from St. Irenaeus. 
It's a big quote, but stick with me, all right? It's a little bit chopped off, so let me just read it in its entirety here. St. Irenaeus, he wrote this uh, text called Against the Heresies, and he was basically talking about how sometimes we read the scriptures and we misunderstand it, we approach it not the best way. He says, if anyone reads the scriptures this way, he'll find in them the word concerning Christ and a foreshadowing of the new calling. Christ is the treasure which was hidden in the field. A treasure hidden in the scriptures. He was indicated by means of types and parables, which couldn't be understood by human beings prior to the consummation of those things which had been predicted, that is, the advent of the Lord. He's saying, how would they have known until the consummation, until Christ came and fulfilled? As we heard during the discussion, they were just words that weren't clearly to be weren't clearly understood at the time. For every prophecy before its fulfillment is nothing but an enigma and ambiguity to human beings. But when the time has arrived and the prediction has come to pass, then it has an exact exegesis or explanation. For this reason, when at this present time the law is read by the Jews, it's like a myth. They don't possess the explanation of all things which pertain to the human advent of Jesus, the Son of God. But when it's read by Christians, it's a treasure, hid in a field, but brought to light by the cross of Christ and prefiguring the kingdom of Christ. In this manner then, I've shown it to be, if anyone read the scriptures. Search the scriptures and find Jesus, my friends. He's there. He's there. We just have to look for them. Look for him. In Luke chapter 24, verse 32, really last, 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 last verse. I want to tell you when you search the scriptures daily and you begin to be more aware of the one who is hidden in plain view right in front of you, you will have this experience that those two disciples on the road to Emmaus had after Jesus opened up their eyes to see him. Let me read to you verse Luke 24, verse 32, and then we'll, we'll close. And they said to one another, so Jesus has just finished explaining to them. He broke bread. He if you will, had Eucharist with them. He offered himself, not just in word, but in, in, in the Eucharist as well. And then he disappears from their midst. And in verse 32, they said, And they said to one another, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened up the scriptures to us? There is something that is so invigorating and life-giving and enjoyable when we read the scriptures and we find Jesus there. And our hearts burn with joy and passion and love for Christ as we meet him there. I want to encourage you to read the scriptures every day searching for Christ. And ask him to lift the veil. Start by immersing yourself into him. Opening yourself in prayer to him so that when you begin to read and you begin to open up. And you begin to search for him. You're saying, Jesus, I want to know you. You are the truth that matters. And I want to come to not just know you in an intellectual way, but I want to experience you more personally and more deeply. All glory to his name forever. Amen. All right, next week we're going to, um, if you have any questions, I'll stick around afterwards, okay? Uh, next week uh, we're going to continue this series, Hidden in Plain View. Uh, and Joe is going to be talking to us about how God is hidden in the mundane in the world right around us in our ordinary lives, okay? So please uh, let others know next Sunday uh, if you think that's a topic that might be helpful. How do we see God in the ordinary day as we pass through this world? How do we find him? How do we see him right there hidden in plain view? All right, let's pray.